Next item of business is topical questions, and we start with question number one from Mike Rumbles. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with ScotRail in light of the company reportedly receiving record fines for its performance in the last financial year. Minister Hamza Youssef. I uh, spoke to <coughs> Alex Hines uh, over the weekend and reiterated the point that it uh, simply uh, isn't uh, good enough. Officials at Transport Scotland also discuss performance with ScotRail on an almost daily basis uh, and challenge areas which are not performing to an acceptable level. Uh, this has resulted in ScotRail providing action plans for several areas of concern and initiating now two internal reviews, one that will focus on recruitment uh, and resourcing and the other one on managing proactive and reactive maintenance and repairs. Uh, this approach ensures that the onus to improve substandard assets, facilities at stations or indeed on trains rest squarely on the shoulders of the franchisee uh, as penalties are deducted from the subsidy they receive and reinvested in driving up quality through other customer facing improvements. Uh, despite the volume of penalties accrued through the Squire regime, uh, it should be worth noting there has been some recent uh, improvements in performance, particularly on train punctuality and indeed uh, the, the uh, recommendations within the Donovan, Donovan review. Mike Rumbles. Now, the Minister is aware that ScotRail missed the performance targets in 22 out of 34 areas and things like trains actually arriving on time, skipping stops, poor train seating and cleanliness and in the first three months of this year had accumulated £1.6 million in financial penalties. Now, we discussed this with the Minister at length in Parliament and in committee when he talked about um, his own government's rail improvement plan. So what happened to the Scottish Government's own rail improvement plan, which the Minister said to us would drive up performance levels? Minister. Well, he's confusing uh, a couple of areas, and if I can provide some, some clarity in, in an effort to genuinely try to attempt to be helpful here, that when it comes to performance in terms of the PPM measures uh, and, and what was happening in relation to skipping of stops, uh, the two that he mentioned, uh, they were part of the internal Donovan review which took place, of which 20 recommendations came forward, and ScotRail uh, decided to accept every single one of those 20 recommendations. As a result of that, we've seen performance in terms of PPM uh, uh, going go a positive trajectory. For example, in last week, uh, most of the performance during both uh, morning and evening peak uh, was in the mid to high 90s. In fact, the best day of 2018 was recorded uh, last uh, week. Uh, they continue to be the, the best large operator, Scott Rail. And in terms of skipping stops, uh, that recommendation, we're also seeing the fruits of that. So, for example, on Friday, uh, not a single train skipped a stop. So we are seeing some improvements in some areas. But we're not seeing some improvements in clearly the areas that the Squire regime uh, measures. Uh, therefore, some action plans have been requested because we're two consecutive Squire periods. Uh, the, the trajectory has been downward. Uh, we request those action plans. Uh, and of course, uh, I'll keep the member updated on, on, on how that progress is going. So there's still a way to go, but it would be, I think, wrong to suggest that there hasn't been any performance uh, improvements where there clearly has been. Mike Rumbles. No one has suggested that there hasn't been any improvements, but They've failed 22 out of 34 areas. And just giving one, uh, 57, trains actually arriving on time, 57%, which is lower than anywhere else. And so when Scott Rail itself announced on the 30th of March that it had commissioned an independent rail expert to produce its own improvement plan, setting out 20 actions aimed at improving infrastructure and rolling stock performance, plus the commitment to suspend stop skipping, except as a last resort, what confidence can we have as MSPs and the people that we re represent, confidence in, in their yet another improvement plan that will be successful? Minister. I think you can have confidence from what I just said in the previous answer. That a review took place, uh, an expert that came, uh, Nick Donovan, well respected in the rail industry, looking and taking a thorough forensic examination of performance, given 20 recommendations, and within weeks we're already seeing the fruits of that uh, coming forward, which is positive in relation to PPM improvements. In terms of right time uh, uh, arrivals, again, I would just caution, there's a reason why uh, you know, to, 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 the, to the minute uh, is not used uh, as a measurement. Uh, I'll give you my own example from this morning. Uh, my train uh, coming into Edinburgh Waverley, uh, a few minutes delayed when I asked the conductor the reason for it, it was because he was helping a disabled uh, passenger and it took a little bit longer uh, to, 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 to help with the, some of the access issues with that. So that's why uh, right time isn't used, but PPM is used 
uh, one of the reasons PPM uh, is used. So in terms uh, of giving confidence, uh, there are action plans in place. The Donovan Review's 20 recommendations will see a drive in performance, but I'm not taking away from what he's saying. It is disappointing and frankly not acceptable that the Squire regime measurements and criteria are not being, uh, are not being uh, adhered to. So uh, I know he has Alex Hines in front of the committee, uh, and in fact, uh, in a matter of days, uh, or tomorrow, uh, I'm being told, uh, and I've got no doubt that he will rightly uh, ask the questions that the government is also asking of Scotland. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, Recognising that uh, many factors affect the performance of ScotRail, can the Minister advise us uh, of what uh, adverse effects derive from network rail? Minister. Well, I, mean, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a very sensible conversation to be had uh, with the UK government around further devolution of network rail. There's the kind of politics of uh, devolution, which undoubtedly, uh, you know, will, will, will rumble on. But see, there is, a, there is, I think, a, a space there to have a conversation with the UK government, because there's clearly some areas where greater devolution, uh, you know, to this parliament, and the sooner that can happen, the better for all of us. I think, of course, uh, as, uh, as there would be no surprise to the chamber at all that network rail should be fully uh, devolved and fully accountable to this government and to this parliament. But just one example of performance would be that 54% of delays are attributable to the infrastructure, which of course is owned uh, by uh, network rail. So I think a, a sensible conversation with the UK government uh, particularly when they uh, appoint a new chief exec of Network Rail uh, around further devolution of Network Rail to this parliament uh, is something that hopefully uh, most in this chamber can agree with. Colin Smith. The square performance figures show that Scott Rail have gone from hitting 19 targets for the same quarter in 2015-16 to just 12 for 2017-18. But behind those figures are hard-pressed passengers paying ever-increasing fares for a failure of performance in two-thirds of targets from the state of stations to the cleanliness of the trains they travel on. So will the Transport Minister therefore issue a public apology to those passengers? And given that Abelio have never met the target for station CCTV and security since they were awarded the ScotRail franchise, when will the Transport Minister personally intervene to put a stop to the cuts in CCTV staffing being implemented by ScotRail that have led to the current industrial dispute and plummeting performance? Minister. It's incredible when I've just mentioned the fact that last week they had their best performance day of 2018, they're the best, largest operator in the entire UK, uh, the fact that skip stopping has been reduced to its lowest uh, uh, figures uh, you know, in recent times, then the fact that uh, he can't even recognise and put on record his thanks to railway workers for the incredible effort and tireless energy that they put in into building Scotland's best ever railway speaks volumes of how interested he in his cheap political attacks as opposed to standing up for railway workers who are doing a great job, uh, I have to say. In terms of uh, answering his question in a little bit more uh, detail, let me say to him that uh, I find it, again, incredible that Colin Smith never comes to this chamber with any constructive ideas. Uh, when it comes to Squire regime, there are action parts, there are action plans uh, in place. So instead of sniping from the sidelines, he might want to come forward with something constructive and get involved in this effort to build the best railway Scotland has ever had. Jimmy Green. Uh, the, the Transport Minister wants to have a conversation about full devolution of network rail, but network rail isn't in charge of litter, train cleanliness, seats, food and beverage, help points, ticket machines, toilets, taxi ranks, CCTV or even station parking. Scott rail is. So given that they fail 75% of these key performance measurements, can I ask, is the Transport Minister satisfied with ScotRail's current performance? And if he isn't, what is he going to do about it? Minister. I think it was very clear in my, my answer to, to, to Mike Rumble's uh, question that, no, I'm not satisfied. And I think it's not acceptable that there's a number of areas within the Squire regime, which, by the way, is the toughest audit regime anywhere in the UK uh, when it comes to train uh, and, and railway performance that they're not performing to the levels that I would expect them to do. So what we would do about it is a sensible question. Again, in my answer to Mike Rumbles, uh, there are now a number of action plans that I've requested on areas that the Squire regime has fallen below particular levels of the benchmark in two consecutive Squire periods. So we have those action plans, but there's also two internal reviews. And I should say, when it comes to the Squire regime, around about a third of the failings uh, are due to the fact that uh, ScotRail have not 
uh, I think, recruited enough uh, staff, and therefore they're going through a recruitment exercise. In fairness, as the unions have, uh, have been asking them uh, to do, so they are going through that recruitment process, which I think will make a difference, particularly when it comes to the staffing, for example, of ticket stations. So there is a staffing issue there which is now being addressed. Uh, and of course, uh, again, when uh, Alex Hines is in front of the committee uh, tomorrow, I'm sure it's the, an opportunity the member will take uh, to question him further on that. Question number two, Claire Baker. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with DF Barnes since the announcement of redundancies at BIFAB on the 4th of May. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, I met with DF Barnes on Wednesday the 2nd uh, of May, at which point I was made aware of the redundancies. I subsequently spoke to both Gary Smith of the GMB Trade Union and Bob McGregor of the Unite Union on Friday the 4th of May. In addition, Scottish Government officials remain in close contact with the companies concerned as well as with the relevant trade unions. Claire Baker. Uh, President Officer, we all welcome the announcement of the new ownership of BIFAB, the news that was particularly welcomed in Fife. And I recognise the positive role of the Scottish Government in achieving this. I accept now, as I did then, that securing new contracts is vital to the future of the company and that there would be challenging times ahead. But the workforce and their unions, who fought so strongly for their jobs, as well as the wider Fife economy, were all shocked by the announcement of redundancies to core staff on Friday, only weeks after hearing such positive news. Um, the Cabinet Secretary, as he outlined, has a significant stake in BIFAB and as the Cabinet Secretary said, he first found out about the announcements on the 2nd of May. Um, can I ask, does he appreciate the shock that was experienced by the workforce and the trade unions who were taken by surprise on Friday by this announcement? And going forward, what can the Scottish Government do to ensure the unions are fully engaged in decision making? Cabinet Secretary. First of all, I think I do, uh, to answer Claire uh, Baker's question, I do appreciate the shock that was caused by that. I spoke, as I've mentioned, to both the trade unions uh, on the, the Friday uh, when this was announced. So I do appreciate uh, th that uh, reaction and uh, completely understandable reaction from the trade unions. And in relation to ensuring that the proper communications channels are held open, well, the Scottish Government has had regular contact with the trade unions right the way through this process and have committed to continue to do that. I would say, though, that, of course, these redundancies really are following on from the, the Ball contract, which was at the centre of BIFAB's difficulties. Now, we got involved because of those difficulties. Had we not done, I've mentioned before to the Chamber, that three times, I think, in one week or certainly two weeks, the company was going into administration, the gates were going to be closed. We managed to both stop that and get to the point where the Ball contract could be delivered. But Claire Baker is absolutely right to say, and as I said to the Chamber when I uh, mentioned the deal which had been done, that this is entirely bound up with winning future work. So as well as hearing from the company about the redundancies, we spent much of the meeting that we had on Wednesday talking about how we can best achieve those new contracts, two in particular. And that's where the focus of Scottish Government efforts is also where the focus of trade union efforts is as well, as well as the company. It is simply the case that work there in future, the expansion of the workforce depends on winning that work. And that's where our uh, um, energies are focused. Although, of course, we will put in place whatever support we can to the employees affected by this latest announcement. Claire Baker. Um, thank you. At the announcement of the rescue deal in Methyl, the First Minister, the Cabinet Secretary and DF Barnes all spoke about employment, growth and continuity. And while I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary's comments about the work being done to secure new contracts, we are facing an immediate problem. I believe there's still an opportunity to try and bridge the gap at the yards at the moment and keep these valued jobs. Previously in the steel industry, we have seen Scottish Enterprise step in to provide training and support for diversifying skills. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if consideration has been given to the role of Scottish Enterprise in maintaining employment? And is the Scottish Government exploring any opportunities, particularly in the oil and gas sector, to bring short-term work to the yard and try and help bridge the gap we are facing at this current time? Cabinet Secretary. Can I say, first of all, that obviously DF Barnes uh, take the operational decisions uh, for the company, but we do recognise the Government has a role to play in helping to try and secure that work within the procurement uh, guidelines, which which apply. Uh, in relation to Scottish Enterprise, they have, it's been made clear to Scottish Enterprise to provide whatever support is possible to the company, including the potential for training, uh, which um, Claire Baker mentions. Um, and also, I would point out that Scottish Enterprise played a very constructive part in the deal that was put together to uh, keep BIFAB as a going concern, so they will be committed to trying to ensure that they can do whatever they can. So that discussion uh, is going on, and Scottish Enterprise, and for that matter, Skills Development Scotland, are being advised to be as uh, helpful as possible, uh, given what's been said. 
Uh, also, I think it's true to say that the company are also the ones that will be looking for uh, work opportunities, as well as those areas where the government feels it can be helpful. And the company's background is in oil and gas, and they are actively looking at other, um, other uh, contracts. Now, I've mentioned both oil and gas because Claire Baker raised that. She's also aware of the two contracts I've referred to in relation to renewables. But beyond that, um, DF Barnes have a number of other interests and abilities to do other work. It was mentioned, I think, in response to a question from, I think it was Lewis McDonald last time in terms of fabrication. So all these opportunities are being explored by the company. And we, the Scottish Government, will provide whatever support we can, either to keep employees there for as long as possible or to shorten the time between contracts being finished and new contracts coming on stream. Briefly, Jenny Gilruth. Uh, thank you. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that following the challenges faced by Bifab, there is now a need for a concerted regional effort to bring jobs, to keep skills and to grow the wider Fife economy, thereby tackling the deep-rooted poverty still present in communities today? Cabinet Secretary. I think there is a, a big job of work to be done and myself and uh, my colleague Paul Wheelhouse have been actively involved in that on a number of fronts, not all of which we can make public. But yes, I understand the point about bringing uh, jobs, not just jobs, but good quality jobs, paying the living wage to areas like Fife uh, where such jobs are needed. And we will continue to work on that. And I'm happy to have uh, a discussion with uh, Jenny Gorruth or indeed uh, through Paul Wheelhouse to update her on some of the activity that we're undertaking. Thank you. There's no more time, I'm afraid, this afternoon because we're so short for time. Just apologies to Mark Ruskell, Willie Rennie, Jackie Bailey and Dean Lockhart, all of whom wanted to ask questions on that issue. However, we move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on the Scottish National Investment Bank. Uh, we'll just take a few seconds for members to change seats.